so I, I looked into it more, and it turned out they were doing a production in Shanghai in English, so it was you know primarily for expats, right? In like a hundred and fifty seat theater for five performances. But I was like, oh well, maybe if that works, and that kind of opens the door a little, and then we could get a production of M Butterfly into China. And after three performances, the government shut it down. Party didn't like it. <laughs> yeah, so still can't do M Butterfly in China. Joining us today, David Henry Huang, playwright, Renaissance man. Hey, thanks for having me uh, on. Guy about the world. <laughs> so you worked with Prince. Uh, yeah. I worked for Prince years ago. I published a magazine for him that no one ever saw. But the fact is that you got to co-write a song with him. Well, yeah, that whole story is, um, I mean, the two pop stars that meant a lot to me growing up were David Bowie and Prince. And um, so I'd always been a huge fan. And um, when my first Broadway play, And Butterfly, was running, in the late 80s, I saw in People Magazine once that Prince was there. And I was like, how come nobody told me? Um, and then eventually I started to hear from Paisley Park that he wanted to have a meeting. And um, he basically wanted to do a musical. And he wanted to do sort of a musical based on, uh, sort of an autobiographical musical based on some sort of relationship uh, between a pop star and a groupie. And um, the musical never really came about, but he said, um, you know, I'm going to do this song and it's going to have, um, it's going to have like a spoken word section in the middle and I want you to write that. So I sent him some stuff and then like a, really three or four days later, I got a cassette because those were, we still sure, cassettes yeah. in those days, yeah. um, of this song that he'd actually made into a song called Solo. And I thought, well, this is the best piece of fan memorabilia anyone could ever <laughs> ask for. And then about a year later, um, someone from Paisley Park calls me and says that's the B-side of the single and it's going to be on the album. And so now I have a gold album on my wall, which is, you know, that's the best piece of fan mem memorabilia. Now, was that the 11th record? Or was no, that, that was um, Come, oh, okay. which was yeah, his yeah, last absolutely. album for Warner Brothers. For Warner Brothers, absolutely, yeah. yeah. I didn't know. Who knew? Mm -hmm. And because he's, he's not, you know, he's so shy, as you know. Did mm -hmm. you get to meet with I him? I did. And, yeah, and hang yeah. out. You know how shy he is. Well, we didn't really, I wouldn't say we hung out, but um, he did show up at the hotel. You know, I went up to his, his uh, one of his floors, <laughs> and um, he showed up in full Prince regalia. Yeah. You know, heels and everything. And, you know, we talked for, I'd say, about an hour. And I, I he's seen people, you know, talk about his eccentricities, but... Yeah, Julie, I thought we had a pretty straightforward conversation. Um, what are you currently reading? Uh, I am reading this book about uh, China, not totally surprisingly, um, which is about the um, just about the, the sort of upper levels of the uh, essentially the Politburo, and um, finding that really fascinating. And I'm just you know I'm going through a period when I'm interested in. U.S.-China relations and what's going on in China. Now, do you find when you read for pleasure that it often sparks your next project, or do you go into something thinking this might be an intriguing subject? I need to read more. It's. I would say usually it's something that's around an area that I'm interested in, in working on. I mean, it. You know, there's it's, there's a fine line between what are you interested in and then what do you end up writing about. So it's pretty fluid. But um, generally, in the back of my mind, I'm kind of at least you know trolling for possible stories and subjects for plays. And how about as a young playwright when you were just, you know, when you were in college and you were just starting out? And, well, when I, I mean, I didn't, I'm not one of these people who grew up going to theater, so um, the, if anything, I mean, I've always been a violinist, so in high school I played in the, um, you know, in the, in the pit orchestra for musicals, and, right. but I always found that kind of interesting. And then when I got to college, I went to see a play and I thought, oh, I can probably do this. Um, and I found a professor who was willing to uh, take a look at them. He told me they were really bad, which they were, and that my problem was that I wanted to write plays, but I didn't actually know anything about the theater. Um, and, but then he set up this whole program for me to, to learn more and read more. And at that point, um, you know, I didn't really know what I was going to write about. I, I, w I grew up in uh, a sort of an evangelical fundamentalist. 
Um, so, and I was kind of weaning myself away from that at the time. So that was the thing I was most interested in. But then at a certain point, um, I got to study with Sam Shepard and Irene Fernez and they encouraged us to write more from our unconscious. And that's when all these kind of East-West issues started showing up on the page. Um, so, uh, you know, when I was a young playwright, I feel like I was kind of first trying to find what my voice is or, you know, subject matter is maybe even too limited, but the, like, what, what am I interested in? Who are you? Yeah. Right. I would talk about Sam Shepard. I mean, that, this is at Yale after you no, left or Stanford. This was before, yeah. This was uh, the summer before my senior year at Stanford. I um, uh, was home in L.A. and I saw an ad that said, study playwriting with Sam Shepard. And I was wow. a huge fan of his. So I clipped this thing and sent it in. And it was the first year of what eventually became known as the Padre Hills Playwrights Festival, which was a pretty substantial event for many subsequent years. But this was only the first year that they'd ever done this. So there were only two of us that applied to be students. So we both got in. <laughs> and Sam, at that point, was um, he just uh, done the movie uh, as an actor, Days of Heaven, Terrence Malick's sure. movie. Um, this is this is after Tooth of the Crime. I'm thinking chronologically. He'd written Tooth of Crime. Yeah, Tooth of Crime was like '73, I think. Okay. Um, and he just, I think, won the Pulitzer for Buried Child. So he, and he'd, he'd started to become a movie actor, but he was still basically a playwright then. Right. Um, you know, showed up in Southern California in his pickup truck, and uh, and uh, because I was a violinist, I started just kind of bringing my instrument, and because I, I was, I, I'm a jazz violinist, so I was and improvising around, and then he asked me to like do music for a, you know a piece that he was doing there, wow. and that's how we kind of got to know each other. Playing a little uh, Grappelli. Yeah, well, you know, Grappelli and, and I mean, Jean Le Ponte was a, sure. you know, huge. Oh, Jean Le Ponte, yeah. And, yeah, and um, there, I mean, there's actually a, a, a lot more jazz violinists now. But I mean, I started to pick it up again lately, and I, you know, got myself a new instrument. And I felt like Rip Van Winkle, because the instruments <laughs> are so much better. I mean, they can do so many more things. Right. At that point, you were still kind of basically taking an acoustic violin and putting a Barcus Berry pickup on it. <laughs> But it's interesting that music was your first love and the lyrical quality of language. Did mm -hmm. that help you, you think? I, I mean, I think it, it plays a big role in how I think of writing because, uh, I mean, I, on the one hand, writing a play is kind of like writing a novel in that it's got characters and words and everything. But I think it's equally like writing music. And so for me, the, the words on the page are not that important. It's kind of like the notes on a staff. Uh, and when I'm in rehearsal, I don't, I don't like to look at my script. I really just like to notice what's going on with the actors. And then when there's something that feels, you know, untrue to me or it's too long or something, then I go back into the script and try and figure out where that is so I can cut it or make changes. But it's, you know, it's like, what does it sound like? What right. is it? How does it live in the air? And then how does it present itself and breathe mm -hmm. as an organic yeah. entity? Absolutely. Yeah, that's very interesting. And it's interesting, too, that you were in the analytical, the genre of classical and mm -hmm. jazz is very analytical very studied to an extent, even mm -hmm. though jazz, you then open up. Right, you use those tools, right. in a, in a, in, you know, hopefully in a way that's free and create, but you, the, the tools themselves are, are quite uh, specific and mechanical, I mean, a lot well, of you need craft. to be proficient in, yeah. in the nomenclature, mm -hmm. yeah. You know, I went to see some jazz the other day, saw Bella Fleck, and I was mm -hmm. so overwrought because it was so technically brilliant that I felt like there was a barrier for the audience, like the emotional aspect was was somewhat limited, mm. which I hadn't felt with jazz before. Mm -hmm. And I've, I've seen Bella before. Maybe it was just a, an off performance per chance. Yeah. You know? I don't, I mean, you know, jazz can get pretty, you know, can get pretty esoteric, just like sort of early 20th century um, serialist composers can, you know, can start to get a little intellectual. Right. Um, and so you, I think in any art form, really, you're trying to find that balance between the craft and the heart or the, you know, the, the mind and the heart, the craft and the, the impulse, whatever. Um, and, you know, sometimes you can go too much one way or the other. And you got to go opposite with Philip Glass and working with mm -hmm. Philip. Now, did, was he aware that you were, had been uh, a violinist? I don't know. I mean, I, I certainly don't think Philip was aware of it when he first asked me to work with him. And I think over the, I mean, we've done four shows now together and I, I probably mentioned it at some point. Um, but the, I, I, working with Philip and we've worked with other kind of opera composers also, and I feel like, well, at least I'm comfortable around music. You know, I don't know that I'm, um, it, it wasn't really meant to be my career, 
but I like working with musicians and I, I can understand how the, the thing gets put together. So in that respect, it ended up being helpful for me. And did you get to work directly with Elton John when you got brought into AIDA? Well, um, somewhat, but I also feel like, you know, if, if I ever, if I ever happened to see Elton John in a, in a dark alley, he'd never, you know, he'd have no idea who I am. Really? Or was I think that so, so far removed well, from you know, the actual process? I mean, because he, it's, and, you know, he's very upfront about this, and most people, I mean, it's, I've read it, so I don't feel like I'm telling tales out of school, really, but he, um, he, he's not like a traditional Broadway composer in that he's not generally in the room. So he's usually, um, you know, he's touring or something, and then he will come up with a song and record it. I mean, well, you know, there's one new song that we put into the show between our Chicago tryout and, uh, and when we got to Broadway. Um, and then, you know, you get the CD or whatever, and then the music director starts to figure out how to arrange it to, you know, put it into the show. Um, and, you know, the results are really great, but he doesn't work like a regular Broadway composer. Do you find that, uh, you know, it's, I, I was reading something online, it was just completely what I was bemoaning to my wife the other day about these Broadway spectacle musicians have lost sight of the written word. Mm -hmm. The spectacle is, is, is so overwrought now that, you know, where's the story, the character, the, you know, the art? Yeah, I mean, that can certainly happen, and there is... I think this, the technology of stagecraft has advanced to such a degree, and then you also have competing things like Cirque du Soleil, which is really doesn't e doesn't attempt to have a story more, you know, basically. Right. Um, and so, working with those tools, how do you also manage to try to get a story in there? And it's tricky. I mean, uh, um, it's you can the same way that. I was talking a moment ago about this tension between um, the between uh, the the mind and the heart, or between the impulse and the craft. There is, I think, also a tension in trying to create a big musical between what you can do technically, and then also the the older values of having a story and and having a heart and you know good characters. But you know, honestly, if you looked at if you took if you looked at say the 1940 season of musicals. Probably there was a lot of stuff there that didn't work either. I mean, there was because we don't remember it. Right. It's just that when you live in the present, you you know you you have an opportunity to kind of be aware of everything that's going on now, and yeah, and as in any age, there's only going to be a few things that are going to people are going to remember from. Right. And they also talk about now with the spectacles, the the way that young people have their brains have become wired by the internet and by the constant barrage of information. Mm -hmm. They can take in a lot more than our brains can. Mm -hmm. They've been conditioned with the video games and everything, you know, yeah. just the acceleration of information and the mm -hmm. access of that information. So if you go to something, a spectacle like Spider-Man or, uh, you know, or something else, like you said, Cirque du Soleil, where mm -hmm. there's so much going on stage, they can process the information that we can't, we might only lock into one thing. Yeah. Like, where's the melody in that song? Yeah, and I, yeah, there's nothing, to me, there's nothing inherently wrong about that. Right. I mean, I feel like people evolve and the art form evolves, and, you know, me or, or you maybe, you know, we grew up in a certain context and we, uh, we go a certain way, and then maybe, that's as far as we go, and you know, and, and then somebody else it continues to evolve. Uh, musicals now, or even musicals ten years ago, if you showed them to someone who was working on a musical in 1930, I think it'd be very hard for them to kind of grasp it. Miss Saigon or Phantom or something yeah. might have been very difficult. Good point, uh, David. So, as a playwright, someone who might be set in his way, or, or any artist for that matter, do you find that it's difficult to adapt yourself to a new way of thinking when it comes to identifying your audience, what they might perceive as being artistic or challenging or uh, even worthwhile? Yeah, I mean, I think it is a challenge, but I don't actually find it a bad challenge. Um, maybe it's because I'm interested in form. I mean, I like to try new structures. And so the idea that, okay, there's a new audience and maybe they're interested in different things, um, it's kind of appealing to me to go, okay, well, so this is a new set of tools or, you know, toys in the in the sandbox, and what can I make out of them? I mean, there's a part of me that really would be interested in doing a Cirque show because, like, how do you take that degree of technical complexity mm -hmm. and then also try to imbue it with a little more story 
than you, you're, you, you're used to, you know, than one is expecting in a Cirque show. I think that would be a fun challenge, actually. So when, you're, when you were writing early on, you were probably writing for dialogue, right? Mm-hmm. Your earliest plays. Yeah. And now when you look at something, like let's use Chinglish, your, mm-hmm. your, your latest, were you thinking of the entire s- spectacle of theater? Or you know, are you I, still looking at the dialogue? I mean, I have to say, I think even when I first started writing, I was interested in the whole, in, 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 in the theatricality of it. Okay, great. Which is probably why I never was any good at writing novels or short stories. Because, it's again, it's never really been for me just about the words. So... Uh, you know, FOB was my first play. I did it in my dorm at Stanford and then uh, through a variety of fortuitous circumstances that ended up being done at the Public Theater off Broadway here. And, you know... Lots of awards, it, lots yeah, of pats and, on and the back. Yeah, and it did really well. And, um, <laughs> but, you know, even then I feel like I was trying to create uh, formally this notion of, okay, what happens if you take some kind of elements of Chinese stagecraft, which I didn't even know very well then, and... Um, and incorporate it into a, a Western, you know, a more traditional Western style play. Um, so, so it's probably never been for me uh, entirely or, or, or about the words. It's always been about creating a stage event. And moving forward from that point, has the challenge become more difficult? Well, I I think what's nice about when you're first starting out is that there's a sense that you don't have anything to lose. Um, and when, I'm just, you know, I was just happy to finish a play. Right. I was just, I was just, I was thrilled, I think understandably, to have a show being produced by Joe Papp off Broadway. And when a Butterfly came along, I was just happy to have a Broadway play. Um, and it didn't really even matter how lo- long it would run. Um, and then you get older and you have a career and you have, you know, whatever, something of a reputation. And, I would say that as I've gotten older, the rewriting is easier Hmm. because I have kind of more tools. But the first drafts are harder because to do a first draft, you have to kind of transcend your craft. You have to forget all your tricks, as it were, and you still have to kind of dig deep in the soil and get your hands dirty and come up with something that feels alive. And that's maybe a little harder as I get older. Interesting. Uh, do you ever think about uh, actors you'd like to work with or uh, other collaborators, perhaps? Um, yeah. I mean, I, there's all, I often see work and, and actors and, and stuff, you know, that I go, oh, it'd be really nice to figure out a way to do something together. Um, the benefit at this point is that I usually then can get in touch with them and um, we can at least, you know, have an email exchange or something to find out if they're interested in working together. So, um that's a, a, a you know big advantage of being of having had a success. Career. Yeah. yeah, when you have success, it affords you those doors to open. Yeah. and then then when they Google you, they see, oh my gosh, yeah. he's got success. I he mean, worked with call Prince. It. He worked with Prince exactly. Read the minutia, <laughs> uh, which I never you know I completely forgot that you worked with Cronenberg. Yeah, twice actually. Twice because um, David directed the movie of M Butterfly. Right. And then about uh, four or five years ago, we, Howard Shore wrote an opera based on the fly. Oh. I did the libretto, and David directed it on stage. I, I did not know that. Yeah, we did it um, in Paris, and then we did it at L.A. Opera. Fantastic. David's a, I've interviewed him in the past. Very fascinating, fascinating yeah. man. Yeah, is, is there a great artist. You, on the current landscape that you're, you'd like to, to collaborate with, you, th- you think might push you to those creative corners that you, you know? That's a good question. Um, You know, there are a few, again, because I have this kind of, I'm at a moment now where I'm very interested in U.S.-China relations. So there are a few um, artists that are based over there Mm. who, um, particularly, I'm, you know, kind of Chinese hip-hop people and, um, there's a playwright uh, based out of the Shanghai um, Dramatic Arts Center named Nick Yu. And, there, you know, there's a few people uh, who I, I'm thinking, you know, is there a way to work together? I mean, I don't, I obviously write in English, and in, 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 in Shinglish it's uh, uh, partially in Mandarin, but um, I, ca- I actually can't write in Mandarin. Right. So in the case of Chinglish, I wrote the dialogue in English and worked with a Hong Kong-based playwright to translate it into Chinese. Um, but... 
you know, how, what would it be like for me to kind of originate a show over there and how would that work? And, you know, that's, uh, that's kind of where my head is at right now as opposed to any particular individual. Right. And how have, how have you been received over there? Well, I mean, M. Butterfly's never been done in China. Never? No, because, it, well, okay, um, about two years ago I was, you know, Googling myself and I noticed that um, there seemed to be, someone was being interviewed who was doing the, the lead uh, male, you know, transvestite part right. in M. Butterfly in Shanghai. And I was like, wow, you know, because the play has never been able to be done in China for political reasons. Um, so I, I looked into it more, and it turned out they were doing a production in Shanghai in English, so it was, you know, primarily for expats, right. in like a 150-seat theater for five performances. But I was like, oh, well, maybe if that works, and that kind of opens the door a little, and then we could get a production of M. Butterfly into China. And after three performances, the government shut it down. Party didn't like it. <laughs> yeah, so still can't do M. Butterfly in China. However, Cronenberg's movie, because it was banned, um, you know, most of the artists and intellectuals saw it. Sure. Um, and so people tend to know me over there from the movie. Um, and then my work's been done all in, you know, all over other parts of Asia, but just right. not PRC. And have, have, have uh, Chinese artists reached out to you? Uh, about um, projects? Yeah, some, some have, right. and uh, particularly theater people, and we've, you know, kicked around a few ideas, and so far nothing's really come of that, but um, it's great getting to know them and seeing their work, and there's a lot of interesting stuff going oh, on over there. Oh, that's an explosion. Did you feel pressure being Asian American with the success that you had right out of the gate? That, like, wow, if, if I'm a beacon of hope for my brethren, playwrights, musicians, mm -hmm. you know, other Asian Americans who might not be afforded the opportunities I've... I've been afforded. Do you feel more pressure as an artist in that creative process? I think it's, yeah, it's complicated. You know, when you have, um, if you manage to achieve some d degree of, of visibility in a field that, uh, and you're of a particular minority and you know, you're not normally associated with that, then, yeah, I mean, I feel like for a while I was sort of the official Asian American, right. and then for a while Amy Tan became the official Asian right. American, you know, and it's it's a, it's a, really a, 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 a a silly but understandable burden because the, the fact is there's no way that any one artist can represent a whole community because any community is diverse. So it takes a community of artists to represent a community. But still, um, when you get put in that position, um, I felt, you know, primarily the, the most important thing for me was to kind of try to continue doing good work because the only reason I was there in the first place was because people thought I was doing good work. Um, and so if I start to put my sort of political obligations or anything ahead of that, then I'm not going to do good work anyway, and then I'm not going to have that position. So um, that's always been, to me, the most important thing. And then over the years, I've come to feel, you know, um, everybody gets labeled to some extent. Right. And um, I am Asian American, I am a playwright, and I do happen to write often about East-West issues. So as long as it doesn't restrict me from doing what I want, um, it's okay. David, thank you so much. Great, thanks. Appreciate Great it. Great interview. Thank you. Uh, continued success with Chinglish and anything else you might have uh, on the computer right yeah. now that you're working on. Thanks so much. We'll see you soon.